We will now reconvene the Committee of the Whole meeting for Monday, May 29, 2017. I had previously opened the meeting to allow us to have a motion to go into closed session prior to this meeting. Uh, so picking up where we left off, I uh, will begin by asking Deputy Mayor Henderson if there are any additions to the agenda. Uh, yes, Your Worship and members of Council, there are a number. A delegation from Greg Hodges, Kevin Burt, and Miriam Boys, Abbott Boulevard Coburg residents to present and explain petition signed by citizens opposed to the proposal to create a sidewalk on the east side of Abbott Boulevard, Coburg. A response to a public meeting held on May 29, 2017 regarding a proposed application for approval of amendments to the official plan, zoning bylaw, and draft plan of subdivision for Alder Road, Coburg Blocks 84 and 85 LeBlanc Enterprises. A memo from the Treasurer Director of Corporate Services regarding the cancellation, reduction, or refund of taxes. First report for 2017. The Town of Coburg Corley Financial Report dated May 29th, 2017. A memo from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of a municipal event application. 17-53, yes we can. A memo from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of the Municipal Event Application 17-54, Coburg Pride. A memo from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of the Municipal Event Application 17-32, Downtown Coburg Food Festival. A memo from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of the Municipal Event Application 17-39, Nostalgia, the Hope Group event. A memo from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of the Municipal Event Application 17-29, Western Ontario Division under 13 championships will be presented at the meeting. And finally, a memo from the Chief Building Official regarding the request for an exception to a signed by law, 008-2009, Northumberland County Archives, door open Northumberland, the Act recommended that these items be added to the agenda. Okay, discussion? All in favor? And it's carried. Okay. Any, uh, any declarations of interest from members of council? There are not any. We can proceed. Your Worship, at this time under presentations, we have Mark Peacock, the Director of Watershed Services for the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority, to present the Lake Ontario flood levels. Thank you. Your, uh, your Mayor, Worship, welcome, Mark. Mark. Thank you. Good to have uh, you here. Yep. Yeah, you, you, uh, I just, just for the benefit of the public and people watching at home, so the better looking Peacock is the one that's at the uh, podium, <laughs> and that's Mark Peacock from the GRCA. <laughs> Thank you. I feel very welcome. Uh, Your Worship, Mayor, um, Mayor Brackenier and members of council, I'd like to bring you up to date with what's happening on Lake Ontario. Um, I'm sure uh, a number of people have concerns. Um, some of the, just a, a picture kind of uh, story to be told, um, we have lots of, uh, 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 of places to put in boats that boats can't go in. We have lots of shorelines that are eroding. We have um, properties along the lakeshore that are concerned about short bluffs and, and tall bluffs and the erosion of those and waves going over them. Um, uh, different areas, we have uh, um, trails and uh, walkways that are flooded. Uh, downtown Port Hope, the piers are very close to being flooded and some of them are and the, uh, and, um, the uh, dockage is also flooded. In Coburg, uh, the mouth of Coburg Creek is a challenge for a number of residents because of the backing up of water from Lake Ontario and you don't have a lot of beach left anymore. It's actually more water than beach. So what's happening? What's happening is the lake levels are the highest they've ever been. We're about nine centimeters higher than ever recorded and this is from 1918. You can see the orange is the high water level, the uh, blue is what's actually happening, the, the light blue the low levels and you can see that that blue line has gone way above the orange line. So what's happening? Um, the top level is, the, uh, is where we are above uh, ten, 9 or 10 centimeters above um, and that's a, a lake level that was reached um, 
in about 1952, and it's the highest that it's ever been. The um, thing to look at on the bottom, I want to spend a little bit of time on that. If you look in the front part in here, you can see the flow of Lake Ontario is quite high right now, and we'll get to that, but right here in the winter. Um, one of the challenges is um, in Lake Ontario, we have a dam that, that holds the water and allows it to go down the St. Lawrence. It's the Moses Sanders Dam at Cornwall. When we get highs, high temperatures in the winter and low temperatures, low temperatures will form ice in front of that dam. When the ice is forming, they have to close the flow down in the dam so that they can not pull the ice into the dam and freeze the dam. When the ice is formed up, then they can increase the flows because the ice won't be pulled through because it's formed into a sheet. Last year, because we had such an oddball year with warm and cold and warm and cold, this phenomenon often happens a couple of times in a year. Last year it happened five times. And so they were, the, the water was going up and down. They were having to drop flows out of Lake Ontario. So even starting this spring, the levels in Lake Ontario were quite high. What happened as we went forward through the year, we had rainfalls, and rainfalls that were very significant in April and May. In some areas, they're 300%, um, particularly in the area in the Ottawa River Valley. In the Ottawa system, sig <coughs> excuse me, significant rainfall in the order of three times what they would expect fell. That went through the Ottawa system, and because of that, they had to shut down the, the flow out of Lake Ontario. Even with that, they did massive flooding in the Montreal area because the Ottawa and St. Lawrence rivers come together and the way to protect Montreal, if they have to, they try to um, ratchet down the flow in Lake Ontario and that's what they had to do. Even with that, they were um, hitting levels and flooding houses that they had never ever intended. They were significantly, in one of the lakes, they were five centimeters above what they er said they would ever go above. So those are the types of phenomena, those are the types of damages. So they play, and, and there has been a number of comments about this rule 2014, which is the new Lake Ontario management rule. It had no impact. They were in, um, in a mode of trying to protect as many people as possible. They were shutting down flows from Lake Ontario to try to protect the people in Montreal and down the Ottawa River, and they weren't able to protect them, many, and many, many people flooded. So right now, as the Ottawa River is drying up, there are significant increasing flows in Lake Ontario. Right now, Lake Ontario is flowing at about 10,200 uh, meters cubed per second. That's one heck of a lot of water. It is the most they've ever flowed out of the lake, and it is significant in that it, it, it creates a quite a hazard for moving ships. So in summary, the, uh, smell, uh, the spring um, began with relatively high levels in the lake because of the, their concerns with managing it. And the international group that it's both Canadians and Americans that, that run this, uh, and they have been for many, many years, um, they are trying to work out better ways of doing that because we're seeing such odd um, um, situations with regards to the weather. And, you know, when people talk about climate change, people say, well, it's going to be warmer, it's going to be drier, it's going to be hotter, it's going to be colder. No, it's going to be more extreme. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing extremes in many areas. And I think this is extreme may become more normal. And that's a real challenge for us. Additionally, very high rainfalls um, on all the basins, including our area. We usually get about 75 millimeters of rain. So in April and May, we would have expected 150 millimeters of rain. We got about 250 millimeters of rain in that same period. Um, the other thing is Lake Erie is high as well. And because Lake Erie is high, there is no dam at the end of Lake Erie. It's just the Niagara River and it flows into Lake Ontario. It counts for about 85% of the water that goes into Lake Ontario. But because it's high, we're getting way more water also from Lake Erie. And so ultimately what you have to do to bring the lake down is you've got to have more going out than it's coming in. And that is a real challenge. So um, those high flows in the basin um, are creating real challenges for, for the, um, uh, the International Commission to bring the lake down. So um, they've been the flows have been very uh, relatively stable in the elevations in the lake for the flat last few days. We actually had it come down one centimeter in the last little while. In the longer term, we need to um, have drier weather. 
We, we need to make, uh, the, the lake has to, there's a lot of water flowing out. I'll give you an example. It takes about a week of running 350 meters cubed per second to drop Lake Ontario by one centimeter. And um, the, the Ganaraska River as height flows at about 50 meters cubed per second. So you can only imagine how much water has to be dumped. There's trillions of liters of water that has to be dumped out of that lake. In the short term, it's going to be stable, we hope, because there's massive amounts being dumped out of the end of the lake. Um, without a lot of rainfall, that'll start coming down. But it'll be a couple of weeks to, until we see that come down significantly, and more than that, until we see our lake levels such that we don't have a concerns on the lakes. The um, Conservation Authority has issued a flood warning, which is our highest level of alert for the lake. Um, what happens is we're tracking uh, with the federal government and the province um, whether or not we're going to have high waves, whether or not we're going to have surge, which is when we get different pressure systems move over the lake, it tends to push the lake levels up. Um, those types of phenomena so that we can um, reissue that warning if we're going to see significant damage because of waves. With this high of a, a level of lake, um, wave uh, in the order of a meter, and that's not uncommon, would create significant amount of damage along the lake. Um, we are working with our, your, your staff and other municipal staff to um, answer questions of, of people along the lakes, and there's lots of questions there. When we bring the lakes, when the lakes get brought down, we will be going and doing an inspection along the whole waterfront and providing that information to your staff so that they're aware of what types of damages and what people's expectations might be. So that's where we are right now. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for the presentation, bringing us up to date with you know, the situation, how we got there, and you know, what we can expect moving forward. Uh, and I'm, I'm really glad that you know, once the lake levels go down that you're going to be uh, working with our staff and, and the public because I, I'm getting a number of calls from people uh, concerned about the amount of land they've lost to erosion because of the high levels. And so it would be good uh, when you're talking with them if you could direct them to some place where they can get the information, what they can do to take preventive measures in the future. So that would be very, that's very much appreciated. So um, I'm now going to open up to members of council who may have some questions. Uh, first, uh, Councillor Rowden. Uh, yes, Your Worship, thank you, and uh, thank Mark for the presentation again. Uh, a good reason that we brought him here. Uh, Mark was uh, at our Ganaras Conservation uh, meeting last week and done the same presentation, but we, uh, Brian uh, mentioned that uh, it would might be nice for him to come and tell our council rather than us try to forward that information because he had it on the uh, disc. So I'm hoping that the public will understand where we're coming from and the council members will understand that you know some of these questions can be answered because I've already reverted some of the phone calls to Mark. And, and just for the public's information, uh, Councillor Rowden is chair, chair of the GRCA. So, uh, Councillor McCarthy. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to Mr. Peacock. Um, I'm not sure this is the domain of the GRCA and, and uh, you know, water management, but one of the things I'm concerned about, about the water on the beach is it's shallow, it's, it's staying there. Mind you, it rains and some comes in and out. But I'm seeing children play in it, and it, it, it seems counterintuitive because of the temperature being cool, but I have a sense the water quality is very poor but maybe that is not good sense. If you could comment on that, please. Um, I'm not sure. Um, the, there is, um, there, the health unit does inspect your beaches and, and that, is, um, that is provided and they make sure that it's safe for, for bathing water. Um, I don't think there's a concern with the amount of water in the lake that it's unduly changing the water quality of Lake Ontario. Um, a lot of that rainwater is gonna bring sediments and stuff into the lake, but I, I don't believe there is a concern for that. Um, there may be issues just because of, uh, uh, of the beach itself and, and, and the functioning of the flow out of Coburg Creek that, that, that carry nutrients and potentially coming onto the beach. But I, I don't think I would be that duly concerned. Okay, other questions for Mark? Seeing none then, Mark, again, thank you for thank uh, you. You know, bringing us updated on everything. Thank you. 
Your Worship, at this time we have a delegation by Greg Hodges, Kevin Burt, and Marion Boys from Abbott Boulevard, residents regarding a petition signed by citizens, which is in the possession of the mayor, opposed to the proposal to create a sidewalk on the east side of Abbott Boulevard, Coburg. Okay, well, welcome. Um, I'm not sure who's going to be doing the speaking. Yeah, they've got swords. And I think uh, uh, okay. so. It must be Marion Boyce. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Mr. You. Mayor and members of council, I'm here, of course, to talk about Abbott Boulevard, uh, and I'm I am Marion Boyce, and Kevin Burt will also be speaking. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm a senior, obviously, and I live on Abbott Boulevard, and I want you to know that it is a lovely street. It's wider than most streets in Coburg and it's lots of green space. I should also note that we have presented a petition to council along with an, a closing letter from both of us. So I will try not to repeat too much. Okay. Anyway, people use Abbott Boulevard at all times of the day. They're walking, jogging, cycling, driving, whatever, etc. And we've had no problems at all. Okay. The only traffic increase we have noticed is at the corner of King Street and Abbott. That's twice a day as cars congregate at this corner to drop off and pick up collegiate students. King Street is busy most of the day. And as traffic accumulates at this corner, so does the possibility of an accident. And we hope you agree that this is not a good plan. Okay. The traffic study the town did on Abbott Boulevard showed 94 to 120 vehicles on different days, but at the same time frame, we, and halfway down Abbott, we counted 23 and 40 vehicles. That's a big difference, and it shows difference in traffic at different times, and we wonder where all that traffic comes from and, and where does it go? Because a lot of the time, Abbott has no traffic or just one or two cars. And, and the, the majority of residents are concerned about this congestion and also about the speed of the traffic and the impact the sidewalk would have on their street and their homes, including losing green space and keeping the walk free of ice and snow in the winter could be a burden for some. And we're also concerned about safety, Say, but safety for everybody and everyone who uses Abbott. So we ask you to look at the whole picture of college and surrounding areas, as well as all of Abbott Boulevard, before spending $100,000 on a sidewalk. Okay. Okay, Kev, you're Kevin? I am, yes. Okay. Good evening. Um, okay. I've never done this before, so I'm not sure how I'm supposed to address everybody. I do refer to you, uh, Mayor, by your worship, I believe. Um, I've lived on Abbott for uh, eight years now. My neighbor, uh, Greg Hodge, he wanted to be here. He wasn't able to because of uh, work. Um, uh, he has four children, I have two. We represent six children on the street, which is uh, a majority of them are close to it at this time. We're both against the sidewalk uh, for a number of reasons. We think that the $100,000 could be spent um, better elsewhere where it's more needed. Um, the report with the number of cars that uh, my neighbor Miriam just addressed, um, that was only during the morning rush. And that is very misleading. You cannot use that number to indicate the, the uh, significance uh, traffic on Abbott. I was checking one morning, and in a half hour period from 7 to 7.30, there was one vehicle, one e-bike, and one rabbit um, that went past my window in the front of my house that I saw. Uh, it does pick up in the morning. Somebody that was going to be here, um, but wasn't able to, is the crossing guard, Joanne. Um, 
as you know, there's a crosswalk on King Street. It was much appreciated being there. It's a safety issue. Uh, the parents and children use it. And I spoke to her this morning. There was one morning, for some reason, parents, um, or one afternoon, parents were only parking on one side of Abbott. I don't know why that was. It's clearly posted no parking on certain times of the day on the north end of Abbott, but parents line up and to drop off their uh, students at to the high school and pick them up in the evenings or afternoons. Um, for some reason, cars did not park there, and she told me that it greatly reduced the traffic problem. When there's cars are parked on both sides of the street, somebody is on Abbott trying to turn onto King Street, and somebody's trying to come onto Abbott from King Street. Now you need four lanes of traffic two for the parked cars and two for the moving cars. When they're only parked on one side of the street, it made a big difference. Building a sidewalk will not change the traffic pattern at all. If you put a yellow line down the side of the road, like a bike lane, then that could be a multi-use lane for pedestrians, for cyclists, and that would improve safety and it would be far cheaper than a sidewalk. In the official plan for the town, there is um, an objective to protect the heritage of the community through the preservation of streetscapes. Now, I left a few of the parts out of there, but Abbott Boulevard, when it was built 60 years ago, was designed the way that it is now, without sidewalks. That is part of the heritage of the town, and that's part of the official plan. In the official plan, there's also objectives of putting sidewalks on streets. Abbott is not a collector. In the, <coughs> in the official plan, the collectors are um, Lakeshore running east and west, and Darcy and Coverdale running north and south. Abbott is not a collector. It is and has very little traffic on it. Um, that's most of what I wanted to say. There are a number of other residents that uh, have prepared some things. I don't know if they're allowed to speak or not, but maybe they're not. Okay. Um, anyway, they came out for moral support. Okay. Uh, well, well, thank you, uh, Kevin. And I do, I do have the petition here, which I will pass around to council. I see there's a note on it. It's not for public information, but just to share with councillors. Oh, there's one other thing with uh, regarding the petition. Um, some people uh, claim that we're not building the sidewalks for the current residents; that we're building it for the future. Well. The people that are moving in, I know three houses that have sold, and I know the owners of those houses, and they're not in favor of the sidewalk as well. So um, who are you building this for if you are, if you well, go ahead and do yeah. this? So just just on the petition, I'll just make it clear to council. We don't have time to, to read it all. I've leafed through it very quickly, and there's a number of signatures from way out in the west end of Coburg, to way, way far in the east end, up on uh, Elgin University, uh, central part of town, the, the condos down here. So these are the addresses that are that are signing this 112 signatures on, on the petition. They're from, they're from, I just want to make it clear they're not all from Abbott Boulevard. Uh, there's even one from June Avenue, which is not even in Colbert. It's in Hamilton Township. But anyway, so there are 112. And uh, it is their money that goes into uh, this. If they if they are Colbert residents, they are paying taxes either because they're property absolutely. owners or renting. And it is part of uh, the official plan to build sidewalks on all residential streets um, for all streets in Coburg. Okay, and so now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to open it up to uh, council who may have questions of clarity for either Kevin or Marion. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Rowden, you're first, and Councillor Darling. Well, thank you, Kevin, and uh, for your presentation and uh, the fact that. Uh, the town has uh, taken this undertaking uh, on different streets in the past and uh, quite obviously it's for a reason, for safety reasons, for uh, we have to be obligated to uh, accessible people. Now take for instance if you were in a wheelchair, would you not want a sidewalk that you could get up and down the street on and instead of going out on the dangerous traffic? And these, these are the kind of things that we as, uh, as the public works and that look at. What We have to bring things up to standards. So you have to understand that there is. Councillor Rowden, we'll get to the debate later. Do, is there a question in there? Yes. So would you would you not uh, agree with me that uh, we we certainly need accessibility uh, for all of the town residents, not just uh, part of them? 
I agree we need accessibility for all town residents. Yes, a multi-use lane on the side of the road would allow wheelchairs access. I have spoken to people that um, need to use a wheelchair and sometimes they find in the winter they're better off on the roads because people shovel the sidewalks at different times of the day and the road is usually smoother. Abbott is kept clear of snow uh, as a priority because it is on the bus route. So uh, if you do require a wheelchair for transportation, um, a multi-use lane on one side of the road might be a better solution. Okay, Councillor Darling. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Mr. Vert, uh, you'll recall I uh, took you up on your offer to walk up with your family and you to school one day. Um, we left your house and started to walk up Abbott Boulevard and uh, I pointed up the street and I said, now can you tell me that's a safe situation? There was a car parked on the side of the road with a lady unloading some children, two kids riding bikes side by side that went out around that car and multiple kids walking up. And I think your comment to me was, well, that doesn't happen every day. And uh, two points, one, accidents don't happen every day either, but as a council, we have to be concerned about the citizens and all the, but the safety of all, as we will debate later. But the one point I wanted to make was after we went to the school and we talked for probably an hour and a half by the time we walked up the school and come back, and near the end of our conversation, your wife was with us, and she made the comment. She, made, she said, uh, I suppose this is my fault because I'm the one that phoned the town and requested the sidewalk. And my comment was to you, you're asking us to agree on it, when you and your wife can't even agree <laughs> living in the same household whether you should have a sidewalk or not. I, I find that very ironic. Well, thank you for your questions. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, the multi-use lane with the uh, vehicle that was parked on the side of the road, they would be parked on the opposite side to where the bicycles would be uh, traveling. Um, it's interesting to note maybe that that uh, vehicle with unloading all the children uh, she lives on Lakeshore. She's in favor of the um, sidewalk for safety, yet she allows her 10-year-old daughter to ride her bicycle by herself on Abbott to school and crossing without, that was before the crossing guard. Bicycles are, should not be used on sidewalks. They're vehicles, they belong on the road. Um, as far as what my wife uh, said, she is a type of person that greatly overreacts to situations. One day when my youngest daughter was in a stroller, she was walking along King Street on the sidewalk and went on to Abbott and was crossing the street probably in the afternoon when parents were parked on both sides and the town bus started to come down the road, or some bus started to come down the road, and she had to run to get out of the way. And her solution to that problem was to build a sidewalk, but that would not, she was crossing the road. The sidewalk would not have changed that. Okay, so I'm going to open it up to members of council. Uh, now, what I'm looking for here at this point is just questions of clarity for the presenters. Uh, are there any questions of clarity before we move on? Seeing none, th okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I'll make sure that uh, this is uh, circulated to council only and not to the public, the petition. Thank you. Your Worship, at this time we have the coordinators who are going to take their areas of... Um, responsibility, and the first being Economic Development Services. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson, please take the chair for Economic Development. Uh, there's a memo from the Chief Administrative Officer regarding the Venture 13 Economic Development Hub. The action recommended that Council accept the business case for the development of Venture 13 date, May 10, 2017, for information purposes, and further that Council approve proceeding with the work to establish Venture 13 to the end of Stage 2 of the work plan, and further that Council approve the contribution of 250000 funded from the Hoco Reserve for the purpose of outfitting the building, and further that Council approve the sole sourcing of a plan and tender development to Piccini Architects. And at this point, uh, through your worship, I wonder if the CEO wants to make any uh, summary comments? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, uh, just to, to start with, uh, Wendy Curtis from CFDC is actually in the audience in case there's any questions.
with regards to their significant role in this project. Um, I'm very excited about this project. There's only once in a lifetime where opportunities come along where everything fits well, and I think this is the opportunity that Council has at this time. Um, there are many uh, players that are going to be part of this, this uh, exercise. The Town of Coburg, Economic Development, CFDC, Northumberland Manufacturers, Canadian Development Bank, and the list goes on and on, and that's uh, in the case study. I think there's 15 to 20 listed in there. All these people work to one end, and that is to bring economic development good jobs, well-paying jobs, and, 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 uh, and bring prosperity to the town of Coburg. This opportunity that we have is to bring uh, advanced manufacturing, clean technology, and information and communications technology to the town of Coburg. We all know that within the next six to ten years that the workforce uh, is getting smaller. Um, I went to a presentation where uh, by 2020, they're saying there'll be 500,000 jobs in, in uh, technical jobs that uh, are not filled, and there'll be 700,000 jobs in, uh, that are not technical that people will be looking for work. So, I mean, this is something that I think will provide a lot of support for moving uh, Coburg forward with regards to jobs and, and, and high tech. Um, the uh, program is extensively laid out in the uh, case study that's provided. Um, we're looking at a fall build with a move-in date of the end of November. If there's any specific uh, issues or, or comments, I would be more than happy to answer them. Okay, Councillor Burkett. So the one real question uh, that I've been asked by uh, some people is, and it may be Wendy Curtis that would be able to answer this better, why is this incubator, this portion of it, going to be different than Port Hopes? Mayor Brock, can hear? Well, I, I think I can answer that. Wendy may have an, an answer, but I, I also have an answer. Um, one of the problems they had in Port Hope was they brought them in uh, to the, their, their, they call it the idea hub. They brought them in but did nothing to nurture them and, uh, and, and, and grow their businesses and encourage them to develop their business to the point where they had to leave. So they're quite satisfied over there to operate on a very, very small base. And our, our intention, by collaborating all of our economic development resources into one location, means we can give them tremendous support and we will be developing their business and be like the, be like the, you know, the, the, the mother bird that pushes them out of the nest. And uh, so we will, you know, our intent is to make sure that, uh, that they, they grow and they grow at a, at a, at a I guess, a, a reasonable rate so that they can handle the growth and then move out of the venture center into their own business. So that, that's one of the, that's what's going to be the main driver and the main difference between the Idea Hub and Coburg is the collaboration of resources that are going to be there to grow their business. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rell? Uh, yes, and, and my a comment is that I believe the County Council is uh, fully behind this project and uh, the federal government also, I understand, came rather has announced $400,000 of funding. So that's something that uh, you don't get every day and, and uh, for something like this to go ahead, I think it's uh, absolutely necessary for the Town of Coburg. I'd have to concur. Uh, your comments made are accurate uh, to this point. I'll go to the Mayor, then I'll go to Councillor Darling. Mayor Brockenier. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Henderson. So again, I just want to remind everybody that you know, even though we have a strong manufacturing base in the town of Coburg right now, but that will not be where the jobs of the future are. The jobs of the future are going to be you know, high tech and technology. The manufacturing is going to have to convert itself over to what we call smart manufacturing, and that's something else that we can help ma the local manufacturing with in this innovation center. You know, we can show them how they can operate more efficiently, how they can operate smarter, and, and get better, resu better results out of, out of their operation. Um, we have, a, there will be a, a lecture hall where we can conduct classes for the manufacturing people in town, or anyone in town, uh, where we can conduct live training sessions or even virtual training sessions in, the, in that uh, theater. So uh, I think this is, you know, uh, we would be, doing the citizens of Coburg a disservice if we didn't have the foresight to look to the future and say, 
we want jobs in Coburg, where are they going to be in the next five to 10 years? And that's what this innovation center is all about, Venture 13. Councillor Darling. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, I just want to elaborate on what Councillor Rowden said. When uh, we had the meeting in Victoria Hall and the funding was announced, um, I think the thing that impressed me most was the fact that uh, MP Rudd had uh, a video with the Prime Minister congratulating Northumberland County and Coburg on their vision and what he thought was a wonderful idea. And a comment was made to me when I told somebody this, that you had what? You had a video of the Prime Minister congratulating you on an announcement for funding for, for that. He says, normally you don't get him to do a video for $50 million funding, let alone for the million dollars that was given to this area with 400000 going through to our innovation center. I think was a huge pat in the back, and I think we'd be utterly foolish to ignore that. Uh, Councillor McCarthy and Councillor Burkett, I believe. Uh, you your hand up? Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, so, um, I, I think this is a terrific opportunity. Um, I th I'm sure Council also knows we all received input from the Coburg Taxpayers Association who provided a list of uh, issues that uh, they felt uh, needed our attention more uh, than this. And um, I don't want to go into the specifics, but basically to say that this incubator is a much, much bigger project than um, that we get to host the incubator, which is a marvelous opportunity for the Northern Industrial Site. And it, it it, with respect to the Port Hope Incubator, I happened to see the Mayor uh, Sanderson the next day at, at an event, Food for All Breakfast, and he, is, he thinks this is an amazing opportunity for the area, and I think that's another key point. This is not just a Coburg-centric project. Um, this is going to be economic development for Northumberland County East, and it's too bad that um, the public can't see the depth and breadth of the innovative projects that are already being incubated through the Community Futures Development Corporation. We saw the N100 presentations, and we already know as a council it's happening, and the most amazing thing is that it's attracting the younger demographic of professionals who actually don't want to live in Toronto anymore find a lifestyle out of here, but they have the support to build their their business or the other piece that amazed me is enhance existing businesses through technology. This is the future of economic development. The last point I'd like to make is the Building 13 project has a second floor and it's the Coburg Police Services Business um, Enterprise. And just to remind the public that uh, it's well known and it's public information that the uh, Coburg Police Services uh, does police checks. And this business activity has expanded to the degree, not only does it remunerate, but it, they've run out of room. So what a beautiful opportunity to use the second floor of Building 13 and not only will the Venture 13 incubator offer opportunities for economic development, police services or other organizations in the community, think of that space. It's available. It has a 77-seat theater. This is going to be used by all sorts of organization to lo raise the bar on their projects and the possibility for collaboration is enormous. So. Uh, if I can say anything to the naysayers about this project, think big. This and this has come home to rest here by the um, grants that we've received and the partnerships have been leveraged. Thank you. Councillor Burkett, then I'll go to Councillor Sagan. So I, I would just like to say that I am in support of this project. I work in the tech field myself and I see the uh, growth in it every day so this is, and, and seeing those N100 um, uh, presentations was great. It was just mind-blowing the different um, things these young people were coming um, up with and, you know, uh, really looking to the um, 
health care and the demographic uh, that, that is Northumberland and Coburg. So I will support this. Uh, I do have a second question just in regards to the uh, red funding from the pr province. Have we heard back on that yet? I'll uh, defer. At this point, my answer would be no, but I, I'll defer to CO because I know they're seriously looking at it. And I know we've made a request for 250000 but I allow the CEO to affirm or confirm that. Uh, yes, Deputy Mayor, through to Councillor Burkett. Um, you're correct. Uh, they have been asking a lot of questions, which means they're seriously looking at it as we speak. Um, and if you look at what we're asking Council to do, we're staging this so that we will be in a position uh, when we move forward in, in September to know whether that uh, red funding's in place. The red funding, my understanding, will be all the announcements will be by the end of July. Thank you. Councillor Sigan. Uh, I also am 100% in favor of this. I, uh, I look at the young people that we saw at the N100 uh, presentation, their enthusiasm, their excitement, and if we can even um, uh, entice 50% um, of those young people to stay here and build their businesses. Uh, manufacturing, as the mayor mentioned, is not the future of, of uh, well, it is part of it, but it's not the complete future. Smart uh, businesses, smart uh, companies, and, and people that want a, uh, a better lifestyle. They want the, the historic downtown. They want the fact that they can walk their kids to work or to school and maybe to work. <laughs> kids, will, kids will start early. But this is an opportunity that we cannot turn down for sure, it's it's a it's a lifeline to to the future of Coburg, and a lot of people have said to me in the three years that I've been here that economic development does absolutely nothing. I don't agree to that, but this is a case where the business case is made, and uh, we can bring young entrepreneurs here and hopefully entice them to stay and raise their families here, and it'll make a complete difference. In And we'll measure it. it. This is not just words on paper. We have to measure it, we have to show the results, and we have to live by those results. So thank you. Mayor Brockenier. Uh, yes, Chair Henderson, I just wanted to add that uh, uh, the Chief of Police, Kai Lu, and Deputy Chief of Police could not be here tonight to talk about their component, um, but I did assure them that uh, Councilor McCarthy and myself as members of the Police Service Board would answer any questions uh, that might come up about their part of it. The uh, chief and deputy chief are hosting uh, 35 police officers from different parts of uh, southern Ontario in a workshop both this afternoon, this evening, and tomorrow morning. Uh, but uh, they did assure me that we will be having a minimum of 20 employees in the business services on the second floor. And if I could just add uh, comments on behalf of the rest of council. Just for the public's information, Venture 13, it's uh, known as Building 13, which is the former call center or the former KPR District School Board building directly across from the CCC. So the new name is Venture 13, and that's the building we're referring to, which is part of the course of the Northern Industrial Park. In terms of the comments made, I can reflect the same. Many of us attended the N100 I'll just give you two very quick examples. These are very young entrepreneurs, believe me when I say young and innovative and creative. One individual who I will not name, but his presentation was to deal with uh, bed sores when you're in the hospital and how that can be electronically and technologically uh, monitored so that nurses could be relieved and they would be sent sensors and time measurements when it would be time to actually move that patient. Um, the other one, uh, there were many like this, but the other one was to how to reduce carbon dioxide, uh, reform it into a different substance. In other parts of the country, it's talc powder, but his idea was to put it back into a cement form and sell it as a product that would be safe, uh, both for humans' use and for us to walk on. There was a series of these that night, and. Uh, I can tell if you were there, you would have been impressed and, and your mouth would have been dropping to, to the floor because I know mine was. Uh, the innovation, the creativity. And these young people are all asking for two things. They're asking for a place to work. They're, they're asking for a place of assistance, for research, and of course money. And I believe uh, Venture 13 provides all of that. 
And the most important thing it provides is the collaboration by all the different partners that are before you. So I too am supporting this because we said once before, Coburg needs to be progressive. And I cannot think of a more progressive economic development uh, feature, not just for the town of Coburg, but as was said by Councilor Burkett and Councilor Darling, it's also for the East Corridor uh, because they're coming. Finally, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Curtis, would you like to make any fi final comments because uh, you've been a large part of this uh, throughout? Well, thank you for the invitation. I actually hadn't prepared anything, but listening to you all, I just I can feel my heart rate going up because it's, I think it's a, an incredible project, uh, not just, as you pointed out, for Coburg, but also for Northumberland Region. And as a gateway, to the east and some people may think that's not possible and and I think everybody here absolutely thinks that it's possible we see it clearly I know at the CFTC many people don't necessarily understand all the tools in our toolbox so if you could give me 30 seconds I'll give you the highlights we have about six million dollars available to invest behind business um, we have chosen to take a good chunk of that and use it for purposes of attraction meaning to try to attract those young folks, or not necessarily just young, but people that are working in uh, economies that will be disruptive. So things like cloud computing or the high-tech health things, some of the examples you've seen. One of the reasons we think that's important to attract them to this area is because we have a fundamental belief that we need to diversify our economy to make sure that we're all okay in our region 10, 20 years out. So this strategically is what we've been up to for the last two or three years, actually five years. The N100 that you're talking about is our annual business contest. We launched it five years ago. $100,000 is available to people, um, and there's a, a funnel. People, typically we have 30 applications a year. Only one will eventually wind down to the 100, but there are 29 others, and they're all looking for a soft landing spot, which is what you are going to, I hope, provide. They're looking for non-dilutive funding, which we will do. And they're looking for, um, more importantly than just the money, is the business mentoring and the connections and the excitement, and they want to be in this area. We have clients right now that we're in discussion with to attract them to this area. So if council moves forward, we know where we would recommend that they go as, as their soft landing. So. Again, all the partnership, the vision that you've put together, I, I think it's an extraordinary project. And if the public, there could be some, I would probably just w say that they don't understand the total context yet. And that's our responsibility joint to make sure that information is out there. So, because to me, it's an incredible legacy project. Thank you. Any other comments? I believe we've heard from everybody on the floor at this time. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Against, carried. Your Worship, uh, we now have general government services. There's a memo from the treasurer regarding a municipal grant application from the Northumberland players requesting funding support to assist with costs associated with participating in the 2017 Ontario Theatre Festival to present Waiting for the Parade in Ottawa. Action recommended that council respectfully deny the request for financial support from the Northumberland players requesting funding to support and assist with travel and accommodation costs to attend the 2017 Ontario Theatre Festival in Ottawa, Ontario. And I believe the information before you is quite clear and specific. So I'll take any questions at this time. Councillor Rowden. Just a quick question. Did, did, did they not know that uh, they could apply to earlier in the, in the season for the uh, grants? Uh, yes, Councillor Round, they did. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they did make an application in the fall, which this council declined. The year went on. To their surprise, the play Waiting for the Parade was nominated for a provincial status. They only learned of that well after the fact. And uh, we did not have the only mechanism we have for Northumberland players or any other group is to present once again to council, which they did. And the action, the recommendation is before you. Mayor Brockner, then Councillor McCarthy. Yes, uh, Chair Henderson, I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, 
in, in a sense of consistency, uh, in the last two years, I've had I've been approached by uh, different organizations. Um, one organization was uh, making a they're taking a sports team out to Calgary. Uh, they asked if uh, they I thought we could get some give them some funding for their travel expenses. Um, I said no, I didn't think we could. We don't normally do that. They had, so you have the, I said you have the opportunity to come uh, before council and make an application, but I said I doubt that we will do it because once we do it for one, we do it for others. And I've had another team that was a uh, hockey team that was going to Sweden ask the same thing, and I gave them the same answer. So, uh, you know, I think once we start funding travel expenses for groups, regardless of what kind of groups they are, then we've set a precedent that we can't get out of. Councillor McCarthy. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and to go further with what the mayor has just said, uh, two sports teams, I wouldn't want anybody to think that this is turning down an arts initiative. That's not the point here. We are delighted in the successes any of our groups achieve uh, within their, their fields, be it um, athletics, recreation, or, or the arts. Um, and I, I don't mean to be uh, cheekish to say this, but perhaps Northumberland players has to budget for the continual success they have by actually putting that money in the budget and it's found money if they don't go to the nationals every year. Um, but I, I'm, I'm more than thrilled for them. But it, this is, I agree with the mayor, we need to be consistent on this type of uh, uh, request. Any other comments, questions from members of council? Councillor Sagan. I just want to agree uh, with what uh, Councillor McCarthy said. You really have, and the mayor, you really have to be careful um, with these um, requests that come in after the community grants uh, process has taken its place. We are re re rejigging that and looking at that so it's a fairer process, but um, it's not an arts versus a sports um, decision at all. It's basically um, is it for the betterment of the majority of taxpayers in Coburg? In this case, they are leaving the town. So yeah, it's part of a fundraising initiative and I think there's other places to fundraise and unfortunately, council table is not the chosen one at this particular time. Any other questions, clarity, comments? Hearing none, I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Against? Carried. There's a memo from the Treasurer Director of Corporate Services regarding the Waterworks 2016 financial statement. The action recommended that Council approve the draft financial statement for the Waterworks of the Town of Coburg for the year ended December 31st, 2016. And I believe Mr. Adam Giddings is here to present. So Adam, I know you've been here many times before, so welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I hope everyone had a chance to read over the financial statements, uh, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I'll highlight a couple of items. Um, as indicated on page three of the financial statements, our statement of operations and accumulated surplus, our total revenue for the year went up about 12% from last year, uh, mainly driven by an increase in the sale of the water, uh, which is partly an increase in, in the rates and then also an increase in some of the usage uh, from last year. Overall, our expenses went up, went up about 2.7% from last year. Uh, typically, we will aim for our operating costs to go up at the rate of inflation. Um, some of our water treatment plant costs went up a bit more than what we had budgeted and a bit more than last year, uh, primarily the result of some of the work we were doing on, uh, some of the hydro costs actually associated with the work we were doing on the filter building at the time. Uh, so that bumped up our expenses more than last year. Um, overall, we come up with an annual surplus of about 863000 which is up about 400000 from last year. Okay, thank you. Are there any direct questions to Mr. Giddings on any points? Councillor McCarthy? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I, I, I was wondering if you can put in perspective for the public that um, uh, let's the residual um, revenue what use it's put to um, because oftentimes when people think well if you have extra revenue w w lower the cost but in fact this is all part and parcel very carefully evaluated um, study on what water rates should be so that we're four hundred thousand dollars ahead what what does that mean to the average water user payer? <laughs> yeah it's, it's a, bit, a bit misleading if you just look at the actual bottom line and you see a surplus 
Um, if you take your amortization for the year, which I think comes out to about a million dollars, um, you add that onto your surplus for a year, and that's essentially what we have to spend on our pool of capital assets. Um, so if you go the next page over, I think we ended up spending about two million on our capital assets. So essentially that's what your surplus is going to fund. Now you're right that we did a water rate study, I think two years ago, um, where we went through the rates over the next five years and projecting out what we're expecting the rates to be. And then we also did a financial plan around the same time, same idea was a five year financial plan, um, taking into account the water um, rate study with the same intention, which is to use these surpluses starting in 2017, which was gonna be used to start building up a reserve um, for the clarifier that we're gonna have in 2020. Okay, thank you. And Mayor Brockenier, do you want to make any statement? Because I know you're on the board as well, or are you? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think I've reviewed this uh, three times now, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> and I come up with the uh, same results. It's a very acceptable financial statement. And uh, at this point, I was, I'm just happy to be able to move it on and, uh, and, and get the financial audit for the town of Colbert completed. Any other questions, members of council? Hearing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Against, carried. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. There's a memo from the Treasurer Director of Corporate Services regarding a request from the Student <coughs> Debating Federation for waiving a courtroom rental fees. The Act recommended the Council respectfully deny the request for waiving a rental fees for the use of the Bailey courtroom as requested by the Canadian Student Debating Federation. Uh, I'll take any questions or comments. I believe, again, the report is quite clear. Councillor McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, again, another wonderful initiative. Um, and I went on the website to look up this uh, organization and this event, the Canadian Student Debating uh, Federation, is uh, it's happening at Trinity College in Port Hope. And I, I kind of wondered, and, and I will post the question if, if the information is known, but the reasons for the mock trial in Old Bailey and therefore waive the $200 fee rental for 75 students traveling from all over Canada is an extra $3 per student. Um, maybe I could get interested if the public could be invited, but I'm figuring these students will fill Old Bailey, that that's probably not a free event. But I was just wondering, was there any information on whether this event was open to the public? Did they mention anything? I'll go to either the clerk or Mr. Davey. Not that I'm aware of, but the letter was in the agenda at a previous meeting. Well, and I'm assuming as, as much. So, no, I, I, I can't support this. Thank you. Any other questions, Clarity? Councillor Sagan? Just one, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, I would also have uh, looked like to have seen a full budget for something like this, um, coming in with just the one specific uh, request for the... Uh, the waiving of the 200 per day kind of sits alone as opposed to how much money they're getting from sponsors, how much money they're getting individually. So um, we have a beautiful asset here and I don't think we should be giving it away for free if they've got enough money to get here from all across Canada. Again, Councillor Sagan, you raise a very critical, important point and I'm, we do not have that information. I know in being in council the past six years, uh, we've not once had this Canadian Student Debating Federation group in Coburg, so we have no pre-contacts or information to provide to Council at this time. Any other questions? Councillor Darn? Yes, just a comment in regard to uh, what a lot of people don't realize when they come and ask for funds. Uh, the taxpayer funds uh, Victoria Hall, the Concert Hall, uh, none of these are money-making businesses that we're running. They're there for the purpose of the community to use and whatnot. So every time we waive a fee of some sort, even though we already are offering at a below cost value, um, we're adding more taxes to the, to the or more cost to the taxpayer. And uh, it seems to me that a lot of our time in council lately has been spent with people coming, asking for money, thinking that because you're a municipality, it's an open pot. But every time somebody asks for money, they're asking every taxpayer in the town of Coburg to contribute a little bit to whatever their event or their wish is. And, uh, you know, I think it takes up a lot of our time and people have to realize that we're already subsidizing a lot of these events and a lot of these facilities. And uh, we just can't keep adding that burden to the tax base. Thank you. Any other final comments?
comment question? Okay, I'll call the vote. All those uh, in favor of the recommendation? Against? Carried. There's a memo from the Treasurer Director of Corporate Services regarding the cancellation, reduction, or refund of taxes. The first report for 2017, the Act recommended that Council approve the cancellation, reduction, or refund of property taxes in the amount of $2,092,137.78. The breakdown is Town of Coburg, $811,407.66. County of Northumberland, $435,053.57. Education is $845,703.63. The DBIA is $27.08. And again, this is something that we do annually. Um, it varies each year depending on need. I know it's uh, highly structured and set out for your preview by Mr. Davies' department. Uh, if there are any questions I'd ask, perhaps you would direct them to Mr. Davy. Any questions from members of council? Councilor Rowden? <coughs> well, just looking at this amount this time, and I'm wondering, is that excessive over the years that we've had experience with this reduction, uh, uh, Mr. Davy? Uh, yes, uh, through the chair to Councillor Rowden. Um, if Council will recall back at the time of uh, budget, we had uh, we were aware at that point that there was going to be some extra uh, unusual uh, tax appeals that were coming through. And as you can see, some of these, uh, in particular the uh, 1050 De Palma Drive, uh, covers an eight-year time span. Uh, the 1111 Elgin Street also was a four-year period. Uh, these ones we knew were going to be substantial, and that's why we increased the budget allocation to 800,000. Um, as you'll see from this report, with this report alone, we're already at 811,000. So we're going to have to continue to monitor this as we go through the next few months and see uh, as some of these other appeals shake out just to see where we're at. The other number that we'll be following quite closely is our supplementary and omitted taxes, which is our new properties that come on stream and get picked up. Um, we had budgeted, I believe, 375000 for that number, so that's money to the good, if you will. And on our first sub run, we had about 175000 of that has come in already. So we always monitor those two numbers in relation to each other, um, but we will have to continue to, to watch that as we go. It's, it's very, it's, it's, uh, it's high. And it's a result of some of these uh, larger appeals, uh, as you can see, take a long time to work their way through the assessment review board system until we finally get an end result. And Councilor Round, if I could add to that defense of Mr. Davy and his department, I remember distinctly getting the call from his worship on the Monday prior to the Thursday when we were going to finalize budget that we just received a, a bad news story that uh, after these six and eight years, the bill came due. So we had to have that emergency meeting prior to passing the budget with two days remaining. And the public might say, well, didn't you know before that? And the answer is absolutely not. We, we knew they were coming at some time, but uh, we found out it had to be that infamous uh, Monday. So that's an example to Mr. Davey that uh, we did the planning based on everything we knew, but he's quite right, we're gonna have to be due diligence, which I believe we, we will certainly meet uh, those ends. Councilor McCarthy. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Davey, uh, and I, I was aware that was the background for this report, and I do remember asking during budget, um, I can't remember what amount we put aside for this. I believe it's about 250000 that we do regularly, and I asked at the time, based on this event, is that enough? And I think you've uh, clarified that for me by saying there's revenue in and money out and that 250 or the amount we normally put aside was enough. So my question is, if it isn't, how do we fund it <laughs> if it's not in the budget? Well, I think again, uh, uh, through the chair to uh, Councilor McCarthy, I think that's something that we will have to come back with a report uh, with a recommendation on how to fund any over uh, budget write-offs. If it appears that 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 the SUPs and themselves are not going to be sufficient to cover it, then we'll have to come up. We'll have to present council with some options for some alternative funding for that. 
Okay, any other questions from members of council? Uh, call the vote, all votes in favor? Against, carried. There's a report prepared by the Chief Administrative Officer regarding the Town of Coburg Quarterly Financial Report at date at May 29, 2017. I am going to change the action recommended. Um, I'm speaking for myself at this time, and I'll take any questions, but my motion is to defer this report to next week. And the reason I'm making that request, because I know for myself, I have not, with all my many meetings, have a true opportunity to even look at it or read it in detail. Um, I'll take any questions from members of council, but uh, that's my motion before you. Um, any questions? Councilor Sagan? Can I second that? I don't believe you need no? to second okay. on the committee of the whole. I just think it's a great idea because there's a lot of information here, and it's exciting that we have a quarterly report, but we do have to dig into it for sure. Okay, so just for your information, to be clear, uh, I'll make the action recommend it in the future that it be received, but I'm asking it to be deferred to next week. That would give all members of council an opportunity in case you come forward with any questions. Um, any comment on that? Um, okay, all those in favor? Against? Carried. Your Worship, we now have Parks and Recreation Coordinator. Okay, Councillor Darling, if you'd please take the chair. Thank you, sir. Um, we have a memo here from the Manager of Parks regarding uh, municipal grant application from Coburg Miners Softball Association seeking funds for the 2017 Canadian U16 Boys Fast Pitch Championships. Uh, there was several, several options um, listed with this. I'm going to make the recommendation that Council consider approving one of the following options, and the option I have chosen is with respect to the request of the support of the Legion Minor Softball or the, for hosting the uh, 27 Canadian U16 Boys Championships and that uh, we provide up to $4,000 in facility fee reductions as a financial guarantee in the event, the, in the event if the event experiences any operating deficit. Um, there were some other options there. If you wish to add, add to them, we could have a combination of, but that's uh, what I'm recommending. And if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Councillor Rowden. And am I right to think that uh, this recommendation is because of the uh, community grants, that this application didn't go through that community grant stage uh, last, before? Uh, no, I think the, the reason for it was that the, uh, the event is uh, a fundraiser, and uh, they, they have planned having a, a surplus at the end of the event. The problem being with... Uh, it's an outside event, so if the weather comes and it's a rainy weekend, the event has to get cancelled and there's a loss, then uh, we would um, provide them that backup. And again, that would be just the facility fee that would be our loss in that case. If it was Correct. Canceled. Yeah. Okay. Councillor McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Chair Darling. I, I have to apologize. I was looking at A, B, C, or D. What is it you're recommending? C. C. Thank you. Um, and, and, and if, you know, if the council feels differently and they wish to, to uh, a combination thereof, uh, I'm open to suggestions. Councillor Rowden? Uh, Councillor Darling, I believe the Heather Grundy's here tonight because Brenda couldn't make it in regards to that, so if there's any other questions that could be answered, I imagine Heather could probably answer. Her. Yes, I'm sure she could. Is any other questions for Councillor Sagan? Just uh, one, uh, Councillor Darling. When you were going through this process to come up with these options uh, for us to consider, was there a full budget uh, at your disposal? I know there's there's revenue and expenses, but there's not a breakdown. I mean, you obviously came up with these numbers based on the, something. The, this, yes. The, uh, staff had um, had the fund, or pardon me, had the, uh, the budget and whatnot. They've come up with this as our options as council. Yeah, if you wish, I could have Mr. Huswick explain a little further on that, if he would. As long as they're there and you and you've gone through them, that's fine. We do, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, to uh, to the council. We do have uh, a copy of the budget, and it was uh, indicating a thirteen thousand seven hundred fifty dollar profit and the facility fees were built into that budget. Thank you, Mr. Hustler. Councillor McCarthy. 
Thank you. My brain's not working so good at the moment. Just so I understand, this is not a community, a municipal community grant application because there's a profit. They would not be eligible, or, or, or would they? Uh, I, it strikes me, I'm a little confused, um, but if I understand the request, it's that in the event they do not make the profit and have a deficit, we will waive the $4,000 in facility fee. This isn't an automatic. It's only if they go into a deficit. That is correct. Okay. Mayor Hank, Rock and Air. Uh, yes, Councillor Darling. So I, I'm, going to, I'm going to support your motion. I think that the motion you put forward is the safest one for the town. Worst case scenario, we're not taking any money out of our pocket or our tax base in order to, to support them. Uh, should they get hit by, uh, you know, something unexpected like bad weather or, you know, poor attendance. So the, this, and I believe this is consistent with some things we've done in the past as well. So uh, I will be supporting it. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? All in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. The second item on my list here is a memo from the manager of parks regarding non-motorized watercraft access to Lake Ontario from Victoria, Victoria Beach and Coburg. Uh, the action recommended here, council authorize the parks department to place signs on Victoria Beach to allow non-motorized watercraft to access the water in Lake Ontario from Victoria Beach for a trial period of six months. And I think this is based on a request we had last year and it was in our bylaw that uh, no watercraft um, of any sort was to be launched from the beach and uh, this has gone to by law and this is the recommendation they will come up with. Deputy Mayor Henderson. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair, could you just uh, highlight, because I don't know if I read it properly and that would be me, but where the two access points are, I believe there's two being recommended. Yes, I think there's one uh, west pardon me, east side of the center pier and at the west end of the beach. So they can, if they go in at one end and the winds are taken along, they can come out the other end, um, down by the breakers, the east, yeah, east end by the breakers. It's not on the breakers property, but the end of our beach there. So depending on the wind and where they enter the water, um, they'll be able to get out at the other end if they get in trouble or, uh, Councillor McCarthy. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Darling. When you said uh, east of the center pier, did you mean east of the east pier? Because that was the presentation. They wanted to be, when you think of the east pier, they wanted that little slice in there because there was a little bit of a, okay. But in that vein, um, in light of what um, the presentation from GRCA, will there be some judgment about the winds and the waves and the rain. Uh, no, in fact, that's probably what they prefer, right? Okay. <laughs> well, it, it was Mr. Peacock had suggested that there may be some very um, challenging weather, yep. but at their own risk, or is the town taking some liability here? I'm going to have to assume this is their own risk, just like boaters and everything else. Once you enter the water, it's not our liability. Um, I could be mistaken on that, but... Uh, that's how I understand it. And you are correct, it is the East Pier, east side of the East Pier, there will be entranceway. And as you correctly identified, the windier and the wavier, the more they like it. Any other questions? Uh, Mayor Brockenier? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Darning. So given the increased popularity in you know, paddle boards, um, uh, kayaks and canoes, I, 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 do, I do believe this is a good move. Uh, will this include the, the, um, the, wi the wind surfers as well? So the sail, what they, are they called sailboards? Or Kite, kite yeah, something like that. That, So they, they're, yeah. they're included as well? It is my understanding they're non-motorized vehicles. No, they aren't. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? Um, Mr. Hustle, any further comments? Anything we've missed? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. Well, I guess I w I'd just like to uh, say that uh, this did go to Parks and Rec Advisory Committee. They were in uh, unanimous support and uh, one of the main reasons is because uh, we are conducting the waterfront uh, planning uh, process at the moment and the whole point of that 
is to enhance access to the, the waterfront, and this is consistent with that. So we are looking at this as a bit of a pilot, see how it works the first year. And uh, if the water level of the lake continues, they'll be able to launch off the uh, boardwalk. <laughs> and, and if I just may add, uh, it's com come to be that uh, our business uptown Green Canoe um, is doing very well in renting and selling boards. They've sold them as far as Montreal. So uh, this could be a thriving business. They never know we might have uh, some kind of revenue generation on the beach where we have a kiosk set up where you can rent them right there and uh, have lots of fun. Okay, I'll call, I'll, <laughs> I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. Thank you. Your Worship, we now have our Public Works Coordinator. Okay, uh, Councillor Rowden, you can take the chair. <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, my first uh, item on the agenda tonight is we had a, a delegation a uh, memo for, from the Director of Public Works regarding construction of the new sidewalk on the east side of Abbott Boulevard in Coburg. And the action recommended that Council authorize the construction of a new sidewalk on the east side of Abbott Boulevard, Coburg, in the amount of $100,000 to be funded from the approved 2017 capital budget. And uh, any comments, questions in regards to the uh, delegation we had? Um, Deputy Mayor Anderson? Thank you, Councillor Rowden. Uh, I don't have a question, but I thought it's important just to bring clarity on a few items, so I'll make a comment if I may. First of all, they're quite right, the presenters. I appreciate the fact that they presented alternative views for uh, their right reasons, and they were quite right in their presentation that uh, the it is not defined as a corridor or an arterial road by definition in our official plan. But I, I want to make clear one critical point, however. Uh, 6.4 subsection 1 deals with sidewalk and road systems, and it is from our official plan from August 2002, repeat it 2010, and as of May 18, 2017, our official plan has been approved with one exception. So our official plan is now approved. And this is what it reads for the town of Coburg, and we've been doing this since 2002. The primary system for pedestrian movement shall be the sidewalk system, and shall's the powerful word. Provision shall be made for sidewalks on both sides for all arterial and collector roads. That doesn't apply in this case because they're not arterial and they're not collector. But it does say on one side of all local roads, at a minimum, with the exception of cul-de-sacs and streets with limited number of homes on them. And so I can only share with council my past six years, we have stayed true to that definition. And I can only say we are getting greater pressure uh, as we move towards rightfully AOTA standards that are due in either 2024, 2025, that we're gonna be held in municipalities, including Coburg, to a much higher standard of care for our citizens, whether that be the safety of our citizens or movement back and forth. So I thought it was important to just clear up some technical terms and language because I was thought it's important that you need to be aware, especially our new members of council, this is our policy and we haven't changed it since 2002. And that's why in each budget we have remained progressive. We continue to add, repair, and construct new sidewalks throughout the town of Colbert. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe we allot uh, approximately $70,000, sometimes 100000 depending on the project and every single budget in the history of Town of Culver. So I just want you to be aware of the facts before you share your comments or debates with our chair. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Darling. Thank you, Chair Robin. Um, I have a couple should say about a dozen emails and letters that uh, I've been privy to. And uh, I asked, because I knew we were having a delegation tonight, I had asked two people who are very strong uh, in support if they could make it tonight as a delegation for. Um, neither one could. Um, one was an email uh, which was sent some time ago just in regard to the same issue. Uh, we reside uh, on Lakeshore Drive, have five children ages 5 to 10 in C.R. Gummel, 
as discussed, our household is supportive of sidewalks on Abbott to enhance children's safety during school hours and more broadly to promote safe walkable communities throughout the year, day and night. And a lot of the issues that were discussed uh, by our delegation, there was no issues brought up about walking on a road at night, which we all know is very dangerous and in our long winter nights is uh, even more dangerous. Um, there were several, I've got a, an email, that was that one, Enhance the Children's Safety. Email two said, and just excerpts of them, I understand the support and the need for a sidewalk. Email three was, my wife and I both believe this is a positive step for the neighborhood. But to go on with the other emails I received, uh, this person wrote uh, that there's only six children on Abbott Boulevard and most residents are elderly and we do not need a sidewalk. I think uh, just with this lady having five of them that walk up, I'm sure, and uh, the other gentleman that was in support said there's nine of them in his right within shouting distance of his house and they all are in support of the sidewalk. And you know, they say there's only six children on Abbott, but the next email says, we have tons of walkers down Abbott um, and lots of traffic and pedestrians. Email three says, there are lots of walkers, joggers and children's children and uh, recently lots of cars on my street. So you know, we have people saying there isn't and we have people saying there is. Um, some of them are concerned about the speeding on Abbott. Well, we all realize the police can't be everywhere and if that is an issue, you'd think you'd want to get your children and those uh, in wheelchairs and walkers onto a sidewalk. Uh, this one says, uh, I have not noticed any significant increase in traffic. The next one says, I have been privy to heavy increase in traffic. So there's, there's one each way going all the way through it. So I think, I think you get the gist of all the emails. We're getting pros and fours. It's just a question of how many for, how many against, and who do you believe? Um, so I agree with uh, Deputy Mayor Henderson that for the safety of all of our citizens, uh, we'd be negligent not to have that sidewalk installed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dyer. And, and, and just to, to refer on that, with our uh, uh, director did have uh, the uh, survey done May the 4th, and as you see in your report, there was 94 vehicles in that one hour going two ways, and there was 49 pedestrians. And the next day, it rained heavy, there was 120 vehicles and 20 pedestrians, so presumably the parents took their kids to school by car. And then May the 9th, there was another one done, there was 108 vehicles going both ways and 44 pedestrians. So the counts are there, and, and we certainly have to, a responsibility to keep it safe, as well as I mentioned tonight, we do need to bring our uh, town up to standards on for the uh, accessibility uh, that will be in effect in 2024, I believe, and not only washrooms, sidewalks, curbs, gutters, you, you name it, we'll have to be done. So, Mayor Brockenier, you had a comment. And then I, I did. Th thank you, Ch Chair Rowden. So, when this first came before us as a uh, project, I've, I've had a number of phone calls and emails like other members of council. So I've made a practice do of doing some random trips up and down Abbott Boulevard. And I have yet to make a trip on Abbott Boulevard in my car where I don't meet uh, a, a pedestrian, uh, a couple of mothers pushing baby carriages or just dog walkers. So there's, there is always some pedestrian traffic on there and we must never forget that our prime responsibility as members of council is the safety of our citizens. And to say that there's never been one, an accident down there, does not mean there never will be one. And so we, we have to be very proactive and make sure that the citizens of, of Coburg, you know, have safe transport systems and a sidewalk is definitely a lot safer than walking on any road. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. And, and the gentleman did say tonight if we put uh, bicycle lanes down there, that might make a difference. Well, they're still walking on the road uh, regardless. And uh, so uh, I think you're right. Uh, Councilor uh, McCartney. Thank you, Chair um, Rowden. I, I support this. Um, and I realize the current demographic is somewhat uh, tipped towards uh, seniors. Um, and I... I will share that this was brought forward to the Accessibility Committee and it was instantaneous that when you put in a sidewalk, you open up their world, no matter what the disability is, whether visual, physical, or whatever. 
So uh, one of the reasons I appreciate, and I, and I believe it flows, it is the spirit behind the official plan, is, is the kind of universal design we bring to the town by putting in a sidewalk, particularly in a neighborhood like that, because I think it encourages, for the better part of the year when there isn't snow, uh, we, it can vary, of course, as Mr. Peacock warned us, it isn't about hotter or warmer, it's about more extreme. We may get less snow, more snow. But otherwise, when the sidewalk is clear, this invites seniors to walk or use their walkers or be in wheelchairs or their electric scooters to safely go outdoors for young families because that demographic will shift. That neighborhood will start to move towards uh, families with children. Then they'll be out with baby strollers. They'll be out with for family walks. So for me, this is about universal design and accessibility, and it benefits many, many people. I, too, have been driving up and down Abbott Street, and um, there are a lot of things on the east side that have to do with services, poles, fire hydrants, all sorts of things. And I did call the deputy director th this morning uh, about other issues, but did ask about that. And there was one concern about the trees. And I will put that question through you to Ms. Director Thrasher, if this is appropriate. Because there are some mature trees that will come close to the sidewalk, does that necessarily affect the integrity of the trees? Uh, Mr. Chairman, through you to Councillor McCarthy, our practice recently, in the last few years, has been that if we have to go past a tree that, that is, uh, uh, is not in a state of de decline, if it's still in good health, or, if it's still growing, especially, and we know that the roots will continue to get larger and, and, and grow higher. We've been putting brick pavers around them. You may have seen this in, in, in some places. And, and uh, that allows for the roots to continue to grow. Um, and if they damage the surface, their uh, brick pavers are much more easier to repair. In, the, in a very r rare circumstances where we, we have no other options um, and we have to remove a tree, which we don't anticipate on, the, on this project, um, we, we would re replant. But um, to date, we've been able to, to go around trees. Sidewalks don't have to be perfectly straight. They, they, can, they can make, we can put curbs in them, we can go around things and, and we can go past, close by, past the edge of trees and, uh, and accommodate it by using that type of surface. Thank you, Director. And just to finish my comments, I would like to say that I thought there were some good ideas brought forward by the neighborhood of um, the bicycle lane. We might be able to look at that down the road, but also traffic calming. And I do believe there, there's new legislation that will allow the, the uh, municipalities to set uh, speeds on streets, uh, that legislation coming through. And I hope we can look at that to, because I, I agree, it's, it's, a, it's a road that the traffic may go too fast, and that should be looked at too. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor McCartney. And uh, just a quick question to you, Director Thrasher. I did go down the other day, and like to the mayor, I did see uh, there's a certain amount of traffic in walkers there every day, but uh, the fire hydrogens seem to be right in line with any sidewalk you put in. Are we doing it around the, them, or are we keeping it away from the? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we have a, f a fairly s wide boulevard there. We have a significant amount of property. We only need 1.5 meters for this sidewalk. So uh, we feel confident that we can get by that fire hydrant. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Mayor Brockner? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair Rowden. It's not a question but a comment. I just want to make a comment on the uh, proposed cycle lane that would be painted on that could be used for pedestrians. And I, and I cannot support that because we have cycle lanes all around the town of Coburg. And I wouldn't want to get that confused, other cycle lanes confused with a pedestrian track, you know, a, p a pedestrian track or a multi-purpose track. If that's what the intent on Abbott Boulevard, it would be terribly misleading to the people who start thinking they can walk around all of these uh, cycle tracks that we have, uh, cycling paths that we have all around Coburg. So I, I could not support that. Uh, Oh, I think you're right. We have to stick to the sidewalk, and then if there is bicycle lanes put in there in the future, that that's uh, and it is a good uh, route for people to take Abbott Boulevard on a bicycle lane and go down to Lakeshore and, and around that way. 
Anyways, I'll call for the vote. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Seguin. Sorry, uh, Councillor Roden. I just had a quick comment. I think it's uh, this council should never lose sight of the fact that we welcome um, residents to come to council and talk about their concerns. And I think we heard some very solid concerns tonight. Um, I travel back and forth on Queen Street, and I've seen seniors with scooters right beside a sidewalk traveling on the high, on the road. I've seen uh, moms and with their strollers right beside the sidewalk traveling on the on the actual road. So I think if we as a council invest this kind of money into a sidewalk, basically um, against the opinions of most people who actually live on this street. And no council can, can vote in, uh, against safety and sustainability and accessibility. I think that's our job, uh, to keep people safe. But we also have to keep listening, as we know we will. Um, I, if this goes above the 100,000 and doesn't, um, um, you know, gets, gets above the, uh, the tender documents, I wouldn't think it, it's maybe uh, time to maybe take another look at it or, or see what other streets in, in uh, like Lakeshore, for example. I travel that all the time. And I think we also have to uh, do an education program uh, for people on the, uh, the importance of safety. and Because we can't just stick a sidewalk there and assume that people are going to use it just because we want to put one there. And I think, uh, Councillor Glenn, if you uh, heard uh, Deputy Mayor earlier, it is part of our policy. We've been working towards that in the official plan now since, what, 2002 to encourage that to be done. So that's one of the main reasons, I believe, at this point in time. So anyways, any other questions? If not, I'll ask for the vote. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number two is a letter from Tammy Robinson, CAO of Cuppert Public Library, requesting that Council approve the continuation of the Ride to Read program by providing summer transit access to children to participate in the 2017 TD Summer Reading Club program. And uh, the recommendation is that Council refer the matter to staff for a report. I believe we've done this in the past. But uh, if we have staff give us a report on what's been done in the past, then we'll have some information in front of us. So any questions in regards to that? If not, uh, I ask for the vote. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number three is a memo from the manager of roads and sewers regarding the awarding of the slide in salt sand spreader tender of CO 16-22. Now the action recommended that council authorize the award of the new or demo use slide in salt and sand spreader to FST County Inc. Pit D in the amount of $79,124.94, excluding HST. The slide in salt spread sand spreader purchased along with the truck purchase total in the amount of $282,108.74, which is under the $285,000 budget allocation. This is uh, the addition to the truck itself is being installed. Uh, so, any questions on that? If not, I'll ask for the vote. All in favor? Carry. Your Worship, we now have the Coordinator of Protection Services. Okay, Councilor McCarthy, there was uh, one item under Protection Services. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll place the recommendation on the f floor and then um, provide background. A uh, recommendation that the request by the Northumberland County Archives on behalf of Doors Open Northumberland for an exemption to sign bylaw 008-2009 as amended to erect six lawn signs that are 20 inches by 24 inches and two lawn signs that are 31 inches by 23 inches be approved subject to the finalization of details by building and department staff and the issuance of a sign permit. Um, so doors open Northumberland is next Saturday and the uh, programs are out and there are many interesting sites throughout Northumberland County but in Coburg uh, the sites are at the um, Sifton Cook and the Coburg Library as well as the Northumberland Archives at the library and uh, since the signs do not uh, um, follow the policy in terms of size 
uh, they, they needed this uh, exemption. So uh, I'll take any questions on this. There being none, I'll place the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And it passes. Your Worship, we now have the Planning and Development Coordinator. Okay, Councilor Burkett, please take the chair. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a memo from the Heritage Planner regarding the 77 to 93 Albert Street requirement for a cultural heritage impact assessment and the downtown CIP grant loan application. The action recommended that council hereby confirms that the Her culture heritage impact assessment be required at the time that the application for site plan approval be submit or is submitted for the proposed development at 77 to 93 Albert Street in accordance with the approved heritage permit HP-2016-026 and in accordance with the provincial policy statement 2014 and Coburg, Town of Coburg's official plan section 8.3.1 number four, and further that council deny a $8,500 building improvement grant and 15,000 building improvement loan for the replacement of non-historic windows, windows sashes at 77 Albert Street for the following reasons. Non-compliance with section 6.3 govern general program requirements for the downtown Coburg vitalization community improvement plan CIP whereby information received by submitted by the Coburg Fire Department regarding the outstanding open files in which the fire department has identified concerns over possible work have been undertaken to the building without proper permits notwithstanding attempts by the fire department staff to obtain entry to the building by the owner and or owner's agents for the purpose of undertaking necessary inspections to determine compliance with the Ontario Fire Code and that it be premature at this time to approve a grant and loan application until concert, concert plan, site plan approval application has been submitted to the municipality for overall development proposal in accordance with the Planning Act and applicable policies and procedures. And just obviously we've got the letters before you, we have the uh, recommendations from staff um, and just kind of a background uh, in regards to this. Uh, this came to the, uh, the initial application to do the uh, site plan came to the Heritage Committee on June the 1st, 2016, um, and then was passed, um, uh, at the it came to the Committee of Whole on the June 13th, 2016 meeting. Um, I remember this because this was actually my first Heritage meeting and um, we, we were very specific and we were upfront with, you have to do these things within the um, action that was recommended and it even stated in the staff report uh, these items. So are there any questions or clarity from members of council? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. So second item tonight is response to the public meeting held on May 29th, 2017, regarding a proposed application for approval of amendments to the official plan, zoning bylaw, and draft plan of subdivision for Alder Road, Coburg Blocks, 84 and 85 LeBlanc Enterprises. Action recommend that council authorize preparation of the necessary amendments to the official plan, zoning bylaw, and draft plan of subdivision for Alder Road, Coburg, Blocks 84 and 85 LeBlanc Enterprises. 
perfect time. Uh, I'd just like to speak to this a little bit uh, as we kept that in there because at the time uh, the official plan was not approved um, with the amendments. So that's why we left that in there. But uh, obviously as of uh, May 18th, uh, it was passed. So uh, I'd like to pass it over to Director McGlashan for any further comments. Thank you, uh, Councillor Burkett. You're absolutely correct. Uh, when the uh, applications were filed, uh, the official plan was not uh, in full force and effect, uh, and therefore the uh, applicant needed a, an official plan amendment to um, um, incorporate this particular area at the north end of Alder Road into the official plan. Um, and since, obviously, since that time, on May the 18th, our official plan has been approved, so it made that application redundant. Uh, therefore, all that will be required uh, will be a zoning bylaw amendment and the draft plan of uh, subdivision conditions. So uh, moving forward under the Planning Act, um, if Council approves that um, action recommended, uh, staff would be again um, finalizing the um, draft conditions of approval and the zoning amendment. Uh, under the Act, we do require a 14-day um, layover period until Council can consider the draft plan conditions. So they will be coming to Council uh, in June. Any questions of clarity from Council? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Your Worship, we now have the Community of Services Coordinator. Okay, Councillor Sagan, I'm going to pass the chair to you and you win the prize for the most additions to the agenda. But everybody's gone home. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, the good, the good part about that is when people leave, you know why they were here. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. So we, we lost a lot of people with that uh, one motion that Councillor Burkett I, I, I saw forward. that. <laughs> I think it went the right way. First um, memo is from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of municipal event application number 0017-53, Yes, We Can. The action uh, recommended is Council approve the Yes We Can event on the West End Coburg Beach on Saturday, June 17th, 2017 from 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. And as you can see in your notes, or maybe not, you haven't, but it's, the, uh, it's a volleyball tournament to raise funds for the muscular dystrophy. And uh, always a good event, and we hope that the beach is actually clear by June 17th and we can actually proceed. All in favor? Opposed? Second is a memo from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of the Municipal Event Application 017-54, Coburg Pride. Action, action recommended is that Council approve the Coburg Pride event on King Street West in front of Victoria Hall on Friday, June 23rd, 2017 from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. And as you can see, this is not a parade, but an event for the uh, LGBTQ community and street party music face piecing, face painting, balloons, dress up, bouncy council, and barbecue. And I believe this is the first time we've had a, any kind of a pride event. Uh, Council McCarthy? Uh, thank you, um, Chair Sagan, for asking. Um, yes, um, but I, I'd also have to say I was surprised by this event application. I've been sitting on the committee, and uh, the I'm a little concerned that the date might be wrong, <laughs> and I'm also not aware that this was planned, which is surprising, because there is no budget. So what I would like to do is, um, if um, Councillor Sagan would perhaps defer this till um, next Monday night, I have put in an email to um, the quasi-chair of the Pride Committee to uh, get clarification on this, because it doesn't make sense to me that King Street be closed on Friday, June 23rd, when most people, when m events usually happen on Saturday, and there was an intent to have an awareness event on Saturday. So I'm not sure if this is because of um, the changeover with the loss of our community events coordinator who's gone on to another position. Thank you. First, I've heard of it as well. I just it just came uh, today, so. If everyone is okay with that, we'll uh, delay it till next week. I don't see any problem with that. Okay, thank you, Councillor McCarthy. <clears throat> the next um, um, memo is from the Community Events Coordinator regarding 
the approval of the municipal event application 017-30, Beyond the Blue Box celebrates 25 years events submitted by Beyond the Blue Box. And that's pretty much explanatory, but uh, they, um, they're having an event, obviously, to celebrate their 25 years, and a lot of people shop there. And uh, um, this, again, is an event that I just found out today, but uh, it doesn't seem like it's, it's taking place in Victoria Park in the Bandshell on Friday, uh, July 28th. So there's no road closures involved. So any comments? Councillor Rowden? Yeah. Councilor Seguin, you missed item number three, but yeah, we can approve it, item number four first, likely. You just have to go back to it. I'm just eager. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I, can we, we'll do this one and we'll go back to three. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor? Carried. And number three, mention memo from the community events coordinator regarding the approval of the municipal event application 01735, get out on the water event submitted by Coburg Yacht Club and the Coburg Dragon uh, Boat and Canoe Club. Action recommended that Council approve the Get Out of the Water, Get Out on the Water event on Saturday, June 24th, 2017 from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. taking place at the West Harbor uh, Coburg. Any questions? All in favor? Carried. And number five. Memo from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of the Municipal Event Application 017-32, Downtown Coburg Food Festival. Action recommended that Council approve the food festival in the Downtown Coburg, uh, King Street and 2nd Street on Saturday, July 8th, 2017 from 6 a.m. for setup to 11 p.m. Any questions? All in favor? Carried. Number six, a uh, memo from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of the Municipal Event Application 017-39, Nostalgia, the HOPE Group event. The Council approved the Nostalgia presented by the HOPE Group in Victoria Park and Banshell on Friday, July 14th, 2017 from 9 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. Any questions? Councilor, uh, Deputy Mayor, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, the only question I asked, uh, do you know what the Hope Group represents, because the group, because I'm, I'm just not aware of them personally, I apologize. I just didn't know if you knew what it stood for. I do not. Um, this is the first time I've seen this today as well. Um, fundraising gala, silent auction, I guess it just tells you what it is, but no, it doesn't say what the actually H-O-P-E stand for. Oh. Do you know, Dean Huss? Madam Chair, my understanding is it's a group that uh, promotes uh, uh, dance in the community socially, ethically, technically. It, it's, uh, I think it's a, a broader group than just locally. I think this is a, a local chapter is my understanding, but I, I don't have a lot of knowledge on, on the organization. I guess we'll all have to go and find out. I think I called a vote on that, or did I? All in favor? Carried. And finally, memo from the Parks Manager regarding the approval of the Municipal Event Application 017-29, Western Ontario Division U13 Championships. The Council approved the Western Ontario Division U13 Championships in the Coburg Harbor on Wednesday, August the 9th, 2017, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. for the actual event. Any questions? All in favor? Well, no one can say there's not a lot of events that take place in our town of Coburg. Councillor McCarthy. Thank you, um, Chair Sagan. I just looked up HOPE, and it's a Canada-wide organization for dance, and it stands for Honoring Original Performers Everywhere, and uh, it supports all types of dance. Don't you just love the World Wide Web? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Your Worship, we have two okay, closed sessions. I'll, uh, I will take a motion to adjourn from Councillor. Oh, well, we were going back. We were going back. Oh, need another motion? Oh, okay. All right. I will take a motion. The second, another motion to go into close. Thank you, Your Worship. The Council meet closed session in accordance with Section 239 of the Municipal Act, SO 2001. 
regarding the security of the property, the municipality or local board offer to purchase the municipal lands, purchase of lands for municipal purposes. Personal matters, about an identifiable individual, including local or board employees, the Coburg Heritage Advisory Committee applications. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Motion to adjourn. Council Burkett. <laughs>